This lecture is an example of the safety stock that we talked about in the previous lecture. And I will also derive the expression for the safety stock, the Z1 minus alpha expression I will talk about. Okay, let us do a quick numerical example. So, think of a small town where they have a distributor that sells LPG cylinder. This is the liquefied petroleum gas cylinder. These are the cylinders that we use in our homes to uh, uh, for cooking. Okay, so you get those two cylinders. Most people actually already plan for uncertainty by having two cylinders in their house, so that when one cylinder finishes off, they would make a call, and then uh, they would get a new cylinder after a few days. And by the time the second cylinder would be useful. We are not actually talking about household, but we are talking about the distributor who is going to also be facing some uncertainty because the distributor if you think about it gets uh, fresh cylinders which are which which have been filled with uh, liquefied petroleum gas from elsewhere. So, that comes in a large truck gets dropped off at the distributor location and people uh, also when the demand comes from people uh, that is the random demand the number of uh, cylinders goes down. So, if you look at the distributor itself we have tons of cylinder as the number of cylinders will keep going down and then the distributor reorders uh, somewhere here and then the reorder comes in and, and, and then keeps going down. So, this is what happens ad infinitum uh, the reorder and every time this level goes below a certain threshold. So, for this we assume that the distributor has information about the demand distribution from the customer as well as the uh, um, lead time for replenishing the cylinder. So, when the person comes for the replenishment by the way all the empty cylinders also will be given back. So, we are not worried about that part uh, of it we we'll just worry about whenever someone they bring new cylinders that that will get put in their floor and they will take away the old cylinder. So this is an example of a single item uh, distributor type of system that we were talking about. So, I just wanted to emphasize that this is not uh, an unheard of example. Okay. Now, we are going to assume that the LPG cylinders are demand is normally distributed that is the weekly demand. In one week we assume that on average 400 cylinders are demanded and the standard deviation is 100 cylinders. Okay. So, that is the demand the demand could be not exactly 400, but anywhere uh, from most likely from 0 to about 800 for all practical purposes. Okay. So, that would be the weekly demand. Now, the distributor orders new cylinders from the parent company. So, if, if there is a parent company that will deliver uh, that takes a random amount of time to show up. Okay. Now, the average lead time is 15 days and the standard deviation of lead time is 5 days. So, we assume that the lead time is uncertain with a certain mean and a certain standard deviation. We also assume that it is normally distributed. Remember that the lead time as well as the demand are both normally distributed. Now, the demand is after all a discrete quantity here and in the previous example. However, we went ahead and assumed normal especially in the cylinder case when the demand is as high as 400 these are practically continuous. Okay, So, we do not have to worry about the discreteness of them. Okay, So, we go ahead and use it if that was a question that came up was a wonderful question do not worry about it it would work out reasonably well. The question is what safety stock should the distributor use? So, that here alpha the 5 percent of the time there is at most 5 percent of the time there is stop up. Okay. And also what is the corresponding reorder point? This is the threshold at which they should order. Now, remember that the lead time is 15 days. Okay. So, now let us put down some numbers the demand during a week. So, now T is 7 days I am going to use days as my unit therefore, T which is the demand cycle if you look at it it says the weekly demand right here is the weekly demand. So, the demand is 7 days that is why T is 7. Now, mu D in 7 days the demand is 400 on average the standard deviation 100 on average that those numbers are here and here I should probably use a different color all right. And then the alpha like I said is 0 0.05 we have that here. Mu L is 15 days. Remember the average lead time is 15 days and the standard deviation of the lead time is 5 days that number is here. So, we have all these numbers given to us. 
So, we could just go ahead and use the standard normal table and write down z of 0.95 is 1.65. It's a little bit lower than that, but if we forgot how to compute it, we could use a software like Octave. We could directly just use this norm norminv.m program we had in the previous uh, uh, topic. However, all you have to probably do is to say, what is the norm inv of 0.95? So, this is norm inv of 0.95 in Octave, which I will write in the screen in a second, uh, is basically going to give me uh, the inverse of the standard normal. This is 1.6449, it is roughly 1.65. So, one way to do this is to use a table. So, one way is to use a table. So, table will give you this result. You could also alternatively use norm IMB of 0 0.95 in octave and that will give you roughly the same number. It should be 1.644 or something like that, okay. So, either ways that is going to give you the value of z of uh, 1 minus alpha. So, that is a z of 1 minus alpha. You plug in the numbers for mu's and sigma's and once the smoke clears, we could write this down in octave as well. It is not that difficult. You can just put down this formula. It will give you 530. So, safety stock is 530. Now, if you think about it, 530 is actually, if, if you think about it, is uh, is quite a large amount. In fact, it is more than the average uh, demand in one week. Of course, it is less than the average demand in two weeks, uh, but it is more than the average demand in one week, okay. Uh, now, the reorder point, now this is interesting. When do you reorder? So, this is when uh, the uh, distributor says, okay, I have reached my threshold, I need to order, okay. So, the reorder point is going to be this guy is the average demand in an average lead time, right. The average lead time is 15 days, the average demand is 400. So, this is the demand that you are going to see in 15 days, but we want to be sure that our units are matching. This is, uh, so therefore, uh, you want to be sure that uh, you get this as a number, okay. So, uh, so therefore, you might divide it by T and thus how much should you have? So, when the total inventory level reaches 1387, which is way more than 2 weeks of demand, 2 weeks of demand is 800, okay. This is way more than 2 weeks of demand and this is how much of inventory you will carry. Now, we will do an optional derivation. Again, the reason I call it optional is because I am not going to expect you to be able to derive this in the exam. However, it is important for you to understand how these things are computed. So, now the way we are going to do this is, now we are going to use that NL is the time periods, okay, in a lead time. So, how many are time periods in, uh, are going to be in a lead time? So, D1, D2 and so on up to D, uh, D of N of L is a demand during each of the NL time periods in a lead time. Now, we do require this NL to be a whole number. So, this is really an approximation, but it is not that big a deal if there are multiple time periods uh, of NL is somewhat reasonably large. It is not that big a deal. If it is tiny, it is kind of an issue. It is a pretty reasonable approximation. Now, we could do something different, although that would also be an approximation as if you had arrivals according to a renewal process. There is another way to solve this. Uh, renewal processes is beyond the scope of this course, so we won't go there. But that's another way. However, that has a requirement that the demand process be independent and identically distributed, one after the other. That don't doesn't have to be the case, right? Let's say your demand is for one week. Maybe in the weekend you had a higher demand, in the weekdays you had lower. It didn't matter. Your period is one week. So in some sense, this is a decent approximation of uh, thinking of this as a whole number. On an, on the other hand, if your demand is uh, doesn't matter which day of the week it is, which sometimes happens in cases like the LPG gas cylinder, where you have to cook food every day at home anyway, it doesn't matter whether it's weekday or weekend, maybe it doesn't change a whole lot and you could perhaps do a renewal process type of argument. That's another route that one can take. I'm sure there are papers out there that talk about this in the literature. Now, 
uh, like a, this is what I just said, which is that does, we don't need non we, we we allow with non stationaries as long as we have cycles, okay, weekly cycles or something like that. Now we want an S that satisfies this equation. Now let's just look at this really really carefully. This is the demand in the first, in the second, and in the last of the time periods during a lead time. The total demand during a lead time, during all the periods, must be smaller than what you had in hand, okay? At least this fraction of time. So the probability that the demand is smaller than what you have, this is what is, this is the demand in, uh, during, sorry, demand during the lead time, lead time. We want that one to be the smaller than, this is your supply, this is how much you have, supply in stock. So how much you have in stock must be larger than your demand during lead time. That probability needs to be less than or equal to 1 minus alpha. Now I might use this a little bit later to explain a few things if necessary. I am skipping that page. Uh, so now we have derived, we have uh, essentially shown that D1, D2, D3 and so on, we want to compute the probability. But we know that the sum is normally distributed. Why is it normally distributed? It's normally distributed because each one of them is normal. So sums of normal is also normally distributed. So the two questions we want to ask is, so what's the mean and what's the variance of that? So the mean of the sum of this, we use our standard expected value of a function of a random variable and compute this. So this would be the expect, so we condition on NL being equal to value NL, then this sum will be just mu d plus mu d and so on, mu d. Each of them is identical, so all of them are equal to mu d. How many of them we have? Well, we have nl of them. Therefore, what's inside this bracket is nl times mu d. And the expected value of that is going to be mu l over t. Remember that uh, nl equals l divided by t. So the expected value of nl is the expected value of l divided by t. t is a constant. So the expected value of l is mu l and this is the mu d we already have and this is divided by t. All right. Now the variance term, this is another result that we had before. Uh, so maybe I will use uh, this here. The variance of y is equal to the variance of the expected value of y given x plus the expected value of right, variance and expected value would be slant with the, the expected value of the variance of y given x. We are using that result in the next uh, uh, derivation right here and uh, for that if you look at it, so the variance of the sum is equal to the variance of the expected value of that given nl plus the expected value of the variance of that given nl. So we do both. We compute the inside part first. So this is nl times mu d because the same argument that we had before right here. So it is just mu d plus mu d, this one is mu d, this one is mu d and so on. Now in the variance part, each of them has a variance of sigma square d. There are nl of them. Therefore, that that's what gives us nl times mu square d because that's the variance. Okay, Variance is mu squared. Now the variance of this, remember that the variance of a constant multiplied by random value is the square of the constant. That's what gives me the mu d square times the variance of nl. So the variance of nl is just the variance of L, which is sigma square L divided by T square. And that's what I have here, T square and sigma square L. And this one is the expected value of NL times mu square D. Mu square D is a constant. So that comes out, uh, sorry, sigma square D is a constant. So it comes out and that multiplied by the expected value, which we had before, which is mu L over T. Now that this is normally distributed with this mean that we have from here, and this standard deviation that we have from here, we get this result, uh, we get this result that we have here. Now what this one tells me is, since this guy is normally distributed, uh, let me just, let me use the previous one, D1 plus D2 and so on to D and L is normally distributed. The probability that this is less than or equal to uh, mu uh, d times mu l divided by t plus s, that is equal to 
the probability that z okay is less than or equal to mu d mu l divided by t plus s minus uh, mu d mu l divided by t that is the mean divided by the standard deviation which I want to pick from here that is mu l sigma square d square root of mu l sigma square d over t plus mu uh, d squared sigma square l over t square mu d square sigma square l over t square. Now we want this to be less than or equal to 1 minus alpha which is exactly so these two gets cancel which is exactly the same as saying my value of s is equal to z of 1 minus alpha. This is the value where the area to the left is equal to 1 minus alpha. So the area to the left is 1 minus alpha. So z of 1 minus alpha times the square root that is sitting here. Okay, so you have that here and that is what is used in deriving this result s equals z of 1 minus alpha times this quantity. Okay? So that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you.